We are going to endeavor over the next three days to overcome any shortcomings of language, culture, or regional preconceptions of resilience. You represent the leadership, the communities of practice, the expertise, and the experience of so many people in this world. The amounts of gases that are now being released from the permafrost equal or exceed all of the industrial output of what we are seeing. And that's already here. That takes place already now. I went up there as a young boy with my grandfather, the size of the glacier that came, and how small it is now. Abundance of this river, this fresh water coming down that feeds my people yearly. That is going to disappear. A country like Papua New Guinea is endowed with tremendous mineral resources and now um, resources of seabed mining. Uh, Melanesians are just bystanders. We're watching all this happen and licenses are given for foreign companies to come and exploit. We're engaged right now in what I consider to be probably our last stand if we allow this Northern Gateway project to proceed in our territory. A major proposal to bring an oil pipeline from the tar sands to Kitimat, where I live, that effectively could wipe out what remains of our culture. We moved a lot of African people from the land in order for them to be cheap labor in the mining industry. And in that process, we broke the family structure that bound the people and kept them on the land. The gaps between the rich and poor is increasing. It is the ongoing uh, sort of industrial march of folly, if you will, um, towards you know, a future that nobody wants to live in. I think we're kind of facing the uh, perfect storm to some extent we have uh, where, where I live because we have very pristine environments. We have the oldest living continuous culture in the world. And we have an enormous pressure of um, the resource exploitation industry. The Enbridge pipeline battle in northern British Columbia and the liquefied natural gas battle in northwestern uh, Australia, those are almost completely duplicate battles, uh, duplicate developments, duplicate responses, and yet without the ability to meet face to face, people can work in isolation and not recognize that they have a shared story. We're all in one room, but we're strangers you know, to, to one another. But I think after these three days, you know, we're going to be talking, you know, as, as peers and as colleagues. Since the Industrial Revolution, humanity has been following this model of development that has been so destructive with nature that we have not been able to regenerate nature. So the thing is, how do we go back to a harmonic uh, model? How do we restore this balance? I think right there is the model, that there's a self-organizing model in nature that we need to learn and understand from. And that implies that this is not going to be a command and control kind of an industrial model. This is going to be a very much a bottom-up human rights, fundamental way to approach these things. Climate change, water scarcity, biodiversity, soil loss, forest loss. That's the state we're in worldwide. So this kind of condition argues for resilience. We have to become, we have to get, increase our ability to rebound, to respond, to adapt to unexpected stress. How are we going to deal with the resilience of an institutionalized force in, within our governments, uh, the provincial, federal, and the multi multinationals that are coming? They're very resilient, much more so than some of our communities at, at this point. We need to understand that if we are looking at the question of resilience, um, we also need to understand the true nature of vulnerability. As we speak, there's islands that are now being relocated in the Solomon Islands in one of the areas. They're relocating about 30,000 people to higher ground all across the Pacific Islands like uh, Kiribati. All we are feeling it. My country is one of the very few countries that's very vulnerable to climate change. Quite often, we will be talking about um, building resilience in the future. I think our case is not that. We already lost our resilience. And the question is how to restore that resilience. This is where we're at. 
I mean, this, this kind of is, you know, humanity is kind of hanging by the fingertips and cultures are hanging by the fingertips. I know mine is. And we're looking around wondering, is there anybody there? Those of us who have the opportunity and have um, a standard of living where we can make the choices and say, I don't want this project at all, are very privileged. We know what the problems are. If, if we went to sleep on Sunday, all of us, and we woke up on Sunday, and a miracle had happened, what we hoped to achieve out of this convening had actually happened, how would it look like? There are two successful things in the world, concepts and viruses, viruses and concepts. So you want a viral concept, something that takes hold easily and that can translate easily into actions and that can be recognized easily. We don't have it yet, but I think this is the type of thing that we can have that can create a platform of change that can last, that can be long lasting. It has to be scalable. It has to work at an individual or a family or a neighborhood or a community or a whole city or a whole metro area to a whole, you know, um, and work back and forth. Resilience. We only have 15 to 20 years of oil exploitation in the country, so we need to start thinking in alternatives. And, just, and many people just don't think that they are. People are very skeptical about that because that's what they have been taught to believe. So it's a matter, I think, of of slowly um, describing a positive alternative. We have to be able to demonstrate that the alternatives are viable and that the capacity to deliver on those viable alternatives rests with us in our communities. When you work from that base of people in place who care about the next generation and what's going to happen, you actually create a different kind of ethos. You actually create a caring community that digs in and does the hard work that's necessary to do work in a different, to work in a different way. Decision making at regional level, uh, more authority at the regional level, solution coming from the regions, these are all very good concepts. I don't think very few people can argue against it, but how do we make it work? We are in a in system where the, the education doesn't, doesn't teach people to do anything with their own hands, you know, nothing. I mean, you, you go to school in your village, next step is to go uh, away from the village. The following step is to go away from any rural areas, go to the city. Now in Senegal, you know, people don't even pass by Dakar, they go directly to New York. There, there is, you know, a lot of indigenous knowledge that, I wouldn't say it's lost, but it's lying dormant at the moment because we've got no way, you know, of, of getting those things that we used to do in a particular way done. We should be producing goods as close to the point where they're going to be presumed as is practical. And that goes along with a reskilling, um, enabling people to learn skills that have been forgotten because they've been mechanised or, or just done at a scale which uh, doesn't seem to have any relevance to people's lives. But also processes to do with uh, democracy and creating democratic structures that really help people feel that they are making decisions about the places that they're living in. Change, I believe, only occurs if you can get all of the players together, you can get all the players together, at least talk, having a conversation. Convincing governments and industry and uh, Australians who have a short-term view of economic prosperity is, is our greatest challenge. Uh, there's a very confused narrative in policy, uh, politically, and this disconnect between community and governments and, and, and politics. And, and what we need to do is to ensure that, or try to move towards uh, an ability to uh, look at what uh, should be the re-engagement. So when we talk about corporations, governments, we've got to remember that they are just the collection of actions of lots of other people. And we shouldn't lose sight that there is always the possibility to engage with others at that human level. There's two classes of things you can do. One is to try to change the underlying policies. You have to do that. The second thing you can do is to say, Let's do some experiments. When Spencer and Ian were working in Clackwood Sound, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island, it was the largest civil disobedience movement in Canadian history to try to stop industrial logging. Maps that were prepared by the Equitrust family were fundamentally important to that discussion. We mapped temperate rainforest, and when we compared the disappearance of intact rainforest 
and we overlaid the map of the extinction of indigenous languages. And then we overlaid the map of the loss of salmon species. The pattern was the same. You lose forests, you lose salmon, you lose indigenous knowledge and understanding about how to take care of those places. It actually allowed people to see in real time their future laid out in front of them. Let's think of this as a soccer game, where we're part of a team. And we already have a good defense, and that's resilience. Resilience is the defense. But where is the people who make the goals, who scores? Where are the forward and the right wing and the left wing that sneaks through and dribbles and then passes to the center and makes the goal? Industrial corporations with 60,000 employees spanning 15 countries or something, they know how to organize to get done what they want to get done. In China, all the NGO uh, is um, uh, not sponsored by any uh, government or it's hard to get funding from uh, either government or enterprises. The challenge that we have is to try to jujitsu uh, the powerful uh, forces of technology and capital and information back to the advantage of the local. In essence, money, or better still, commerce, is probably the greatest human endeavor to make the change we need and fast enough. Brian raised the question of microfinance yesterday and he specifically took us down a path towards savings groups. This mechanism works really well. Okay, there's 70,000 people in Cambodia doing it now. When we reach a million people, and we will reach a million people, that will mean that the, a million of the poorest people in the country will be controlling roughly $66 million a year. If you're living in debt, you're forced to live in the past. Having even a little savings allows you to live in the future, to imagine how the future might be better than the present. In Vancouver, in British Columbia, the Van City Credit Union, in its 66th year, is going to radically transform itself from a fairly conventional retail consumer credit union to an institution that will use its $15 billion in assets entirely for social and environmental as well as economic purposes. I think the single th most important thing that needs to happen is um, this whole process of uh, having some confidence in the thought of releasing the creativity and the energy of people who live in a place, of empowering residents to make their own decisions about their own well-being and encouraging and supporting that. We are in the middle of the biggest value shift that the world has ever seen. And that if we can open up the cracks that actually let the light in, we can. it's not gonna be that hard to get from here to there. We need to be grateful and begin to be grateful of being alive in this moment and being able to change this. We have such an urgency and such a possibility that is definitely in our hands.